Thank you very much. My name is Kim, uh, the former chairman of the Korean side of this council. Um, in Korean expression, Wang Hejang, I just the, uh, uh, the, the, the senior uh, uh, representative of the Korean side of this council. Uh, it is my pleasure and the, uh, thank you very much uh, for preparing this conference, especially to the uh, uh, president of the, this institution. Okay. Uh, the first session will deal with uh, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. The expression is a little awkward. Uh, the actual meaning of the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula is not the same. Um, the one we know, the uh, uh, destruction, the complete destruction of the North Korean nuclear devices, nevertheless, the uh, uh, when we had uh, the summit meeting in Singapore, the, they used this the, uh, expression, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Anyway, we will deal with this topic. Uh, actually, North Korea has developed uh, the uh, nuclear devices for a long time, maybe more than 50 years, less than 60 years. And it started to explode its device from uh, 2006 and continuously they did and last year it was it, uh, uh, the uh, 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 tested the sixth uh, nuclear device the uh, uh, explosion and the providing the uh, threat not only to South Korea but also maybe all neighboring countries uh, well I may say all the countries in the world including the United States um, nevertheless, uh, from the end of last year, it suddenly changes its attitude uh, to show us some mild gesture, saying that it wants to take denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. I don't know, uh, it, it is exactly uh, destruction of the North Korean uh, the nuclear devices. Anyway, it, it used the term denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So uh, we need to investigate the term and the meaning uh, of in this first session. Um, uh, the, uh, I like this kind of conference very much because it's such a tricky, well, issues needed to be observed, uh, not by one side, but for both sides, or just the uh, many uh, uh, in uh, from the many uh, well, many angle observation is very important. So uh, we invite the two uh, very dear uh, uh, experts to analyze of the Korean methods. Uh, Dr. Song, he is graduate of the University of Michigan and the former director of the Sejong Institute. He is general and uh, the doctor. The, uh, uh, he will first present. And second, well, you know, the Hutchinson, he is a Korean expert. You speak Korean better than my English. Okay. <laughs> and the, uh, uh, he uh, is the uh, uh, dearly expert in, in the Korean methods. Especially, he worked for the uh, uh, Korean Air Force for a long time. That's the, uh, and also, uh, the expert in Korean methods. He's second presenters. Okay, now the, uh, we'll invite uh, Dr. Song uh, for his presentation. He will, he will take 20 to 25 minutes. Thank you very much. Morning. Uh, as you can you see in the, on the screen, my title, The Role of the ROKUS Alliance, for the denuclearization of North Korea. I focus on the so-called covert operations. In my paper, I will say, firstly, introduction, <coughs> second, North Korea's denuclearization and the covert operation. Third one, covert operation and the South Korea U, uh, United States alliance. What are the potentials and uh, what are the constraints? The fourth one, covert operation, and uh, the role of ROK-US alliance for the, the denuclearization of North Korea. Actually, section four is the main section. 
lastly, summary and conclusion. Relating to introduction, the denuclearization of North Korea issue has been one of the biggest critical issues in the world in the middle of the 2018s. The reason why the rogue state animated regime North Korea has already become an actual nuclear state. Even though the North Korea is a normal state, the neighboring country may worry about so much about North Korea's becoming nuclear state. However, North Korea is actually a rogue state or enigmatic regime. So, for the last almost 10 years, most neighboring countries, South Korea, United States, Japan, even mainland China, have been worrying so much about North Korea's becoming nuclear state. However, North Korea, till now, had been keeping strong conviction like this one. Even if the sky collapses, North Korea will never give up its nuclear weapons. Even though we had a two times survey meeting in Singapore or in Panmunjom, uh, there the Kim Jong-un mentioned, okay, we'll uh, 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 conduct denuclearization of not North Korea, of under the Korean Peninsula. So uh, I am studying for more, uh, more 30 years. That is not uh, real uh, North Korea's intentions. Uh, so there is one evidence. Uh, three days ago, uh, this is June 28, June 25, North Korea propaganda site, there is a sunlight. It's a Korean language, Sewang. The sunlight argued the person who asserts the CBID to North Korea is a national trait. It's Korean language, Minjok Bebanja. Uh, they mentioned like this one. This is the evidence. Uh, still, they don't have any kind of the conviction for the denuclearization of North Korea. However, United States argued the United States is not a country that sits and wait for calamity or tragedies. Instead of that, mainland China argues the nuclear issue of the Korean Peninsula and the peace regime on the Korean Peninsula should be resolved at the same time. We call this one dual track approach or double suspension approaches. Uh, last meeting, the third summit meeting between Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un, they also stressed this one. However, South Korea government, the Moon Jae-in government, always argued North Korea's nuclear issue must be resolved only peacefully. They stressed peacefully. As it can be seen above, uh, many neighboring countries have many different viewpoints in terms of the nuclearization of North Korea. So, my paper presents so-called covert operation as one of the most effective measures to denuclearize North Korea. And uh, I will mention what are the role, mission of ROK-US alliance for, the, for this covert operation. Next, day, what is the covert operation? Covert operation is defined a military operation that is intended to conceal the identity of a sponsor or a lower plausible deny by the sponsor. This is definition. The aim of a covert operation is to secretly fulfill their mission objectives without anyone knowing who had the sponsor or who carried out the operations. This is the aim of the covert operations. There are four ways for covert operations. First one, interception. Second one, sabotage. Third one, expose. Fourth one, preemptions. In my paper, I describe the more detail. I'll omit the description for this one. Next one, 
In terms of the denuclearization of North Korea, many experts argue the many ways for the denuclearization of North Korea. For example, firstly, with the dialogue of foreign policy, we can resolve that one. The other scholars, second, containment of sanction. Third one, changing the North Korean regime qualitatively. The fourth one, unification of two Koreas. Fifth one, shaking the Korean, North Korean regime body, shaking. And the sixth one, were over covert operation. I compared what are the strong point, what are the weak point for each one. My conclusion is in terms of efficiency, the covert operation would be best one. So I am concerned, so this title. The reason why I am so concerned for this one, the first three, covert operation can be a viable operation regardless of whether North Korea has a will towards denuclearization or not. This is very important. Regardless of whether North Korea has a will towards denuclearization or not. In this case, in covert operation, we don't need a dialogue or negotiations. Second, South Korea has the most advanced science and technology in the field of electronics. This is the advantage for applying covert operations. The third one, South Korea has more than 30,000 North Korean defectors. They may play an in, in important role in covert operations. Fourth one, United States has many historical experiences and military doctrines for covert operation. Maybe General Sharp, you know that one. <laughs> and the uh, United States has the most advanced science and technology in the world. This is the advantage for the COVID, uh, COVID operation. Fifth one, United States has prepared a lot of actual COVID operations. Before the Singapore survey meeting, Bolton, Pompeo, they mentioned we have, we have prepared everything on the table. Uh, there could be included the covert operation and uh, can be included that on the table. And uh, next one, in terms of the nuclearization of North Korea, there are two important factors. North Korea has one pact, United States has another one pact. North Korea's fact, important fact for the denuclearization of North Korea is whether North Korea regime will change qualitatively or not. The qualitatively North Korea's regime's change would be one of the very important impact for the denuclearization of North Korea. United States' important fact is strong belief for the denuclearization of North Korea. Nowadays, Trump government has been arguing, okay, we want to denuclearize the North Korea factor. How long this kind of conviction will be continued or not? Uh, this, this is very important factors for the denuclearization of North Korea. So, North Korea had two. They will change or not change. United States, they will keep uh, continually on they abandon uh, their convictions. So North Korea's two, United States two, we can create, as can be seen in table one, two by two model. For example, if North Korea, first case, uh, if North Korea qualitatively change its regime and the United States keeping the strong belief for the denuclearization of North Korea. In this case, uh, now we are saying case one. In this case, if North Korea change qualitatively, dialogue or the negotiation may resolve the nuclearization issue. North, North Korea uh, nuclear uh, issue can resolve. The precondition is North Korea regime should change qualitatively. Case three, if 
North Korea regime will not change qualitatively, and the United States keep strong belief for the denuclearization of North Korea. In this case, uh, case three, if North Korea can cannot change qualitatively its regime, dialogue or negotiation uh, would be useless. Uh, so in this case, uh, it's uh, the direct before the Pyeongchang Olympic Games, Winter Olympic Games. So in this case, we can apply covert operations. So I believe even though we are staying in case one, there could be high probability. Case one, go back to the case three. The reason why North Korea will not change easily, qualitatively, so uh, even though we are standing in case one, it's uh, uh, go back to the case three. So my paper would be uh, important and useful. Uh, and uh, case four, uh, if North Korea will not change qualitatively and the United States abandon the conviction for the denuclearization of North Korea is case four. This means denuclearization of North Korea will be failed. The other word, North Korea becomes real nuclear state. We Korean and uh, so many American will worry this case so much. So uh, I want to try to uh, apply uh, this two by two model in terms of uh, the denuclearization of North Korea. So I believe case one there are high probability case where we uh, will go back to the case three. So I am concerned that this covert operation. Next, the covert operation and uh, the possibilities and the constraint uh, in the ROK US alliance. In the above, I mentioned there are four ways uh, covert operation interception, sabotage, exposure, preemptions. I will omit uh, this one. They, they have each one had uh, advantages and uh, disadvantages. For example, interception had advantages, the availability of the adv advanced science and the technology in the United States. This is the advantage for the interception. The other one, North Korea defectors in living South Korea, they have deep knowledge of the pictures of the North Korea. Also, they can do some kind of camouflage camouflage to penetrate into North Korea. This is an advantage for the, the interceptions. This advantage is North Korea is a highly closed society. It is so difficult for the United States, South Korea, to obtain information for the, the interception or to implement the interception. This kind of things is a disadvantage. So I described the uh, next uh, sabotage, and the next uh, expose, and the next uh, preemption. I analyzed for all these things. Uh, I don't have time, so I omit this one. Next three. is the main, my argument, covert operation and the uh, ROKUS cooperation. There are three mission objectives for covert operations. United States and South Korea can cooperate for this one in terms of covert operations. First one, disabling existing North Korea nuclear weapons and nuclear facilities. Both countries can cooperate. Second mission objective is disabling North Korea nuclear weapons manufacturing materials and missile manufacturing materials. For covert operation, both countries can cooperate. The third one, disabling North Korea core people related to nuclear weapons. Uh, this is another mission objective. So for this kind of three missions, United States, South Korea can cooperate uh, each other in terms of the covert operations. The first one, for disabling existing North Korean nuclear weapon and North Korean nuclear facilities, United States and uh, South Korea can cooperate each other in terms of the following five things. The first one, for acquisition and analysis information, 
both countries can cooperate each other. Second, covert operation specific target selection, both countries can cooperate. Third one, for the de-implementation plan for covert operation, both countries can cooperate. Fourth one, covert operation capability, finally covert op operation implementation, both countries can cooperate. First of all, for the acquisition and the analysis of information, United States and South Korea have some information, but they are not accuracy. So uh, we need uh, to improve the accuracy of the uh, known the information. This is a job for both countries. For example, both countries known some North Korea's nuclear facility, facilities, missile facilities, weapon storage site, and the deployment basis, etc. Uh, we have known some information. And the uh, United States have uh, strong capability, uh, advanced the scientific equipment to, to detect the information. For example, modernized the satellite and modernized the drone map and the self-analysis, etc. We, uh, United States, mobilized uh, all those things to detect uh, the information. South Korea had the capabilities. So, uh, as mentioned above, South Korea had the former soldier North Korean defectors. is over 2,000. Among 30,000 North Korean defectors, there are over 2,000 is uh, uh, former North Korea military soldiers. So this is uh, uh, strong capabilities. We should use that one to getting information. Next, we'll put the covert operation specific target selection. Two countries may cooperate each other. We know 30, 40 <coughs> nuclear weapons and 40, 50 kilogram plutonium, 600, 700 kilogram HU. There are many kind of the delivery system we have uh, some information, so we discuss, we should discuss which one should be selected uh, the main target or next uh, target, etc. So we can cooperate uh, each other. Third one, for the implementation plan for the port operation, we can apply the sabotage. For example, I am very concerned the computer hacking. I know the United States is a top uh, capability for the computer hacking. Next one, China and the North Korea 6s, South Korea 11s for computer hacking. So, I know United States can penetrate to Internet of North Korea's reconnaissance bureau, but uh, till now, United States cannot penetrate to disable the nuclear development or missile development programs. To complement this one, I want to show one idea. How about if we big amount of money give to them, the them is a rewarding computer expert. In Korean society, United States society, there are many young genius who they are spend their time, almost their time in computer games. So, Maybe we have here uh, some. So uh, we are propagandas. If there is success for the hacking, nuclear test, and the result collapsed or reversed the, the, uh, something like that. If we success, the computer hacking will give them, she, she or him will give the $1 billion, etc. And uh, if we success, for the nuclear test, uh, missile test, so, okay, 500 million dollars to give them. Two years ago, I suggested this kind of ideas in Korea. Then, one guy from Chicago, maybe he's American, he sent me uh, emails, okay, I have the capability. I worked as a sauna, something like that in Navy. So, I want to get in touch with you. We, exchanged the mails. Anyway, if we try this kind of things, there could be 
uh, young genius. So this is my idea. Uh, anyway, uh, next one for uh, for the covert operation capability, South Korea has uh, mentioned about over 2,000 defectors from North Korea Army and excellent over South Korea IT industry, Samsung, LG, etc. And uh, South Korea has uh, two Koreas are seamless. This means uh, we can do, we conduct uh, very wonderfully uh, a good camouflage. So this is uh, a kind of uh, capability. United States has a lot, a lot of the capability, a lot of experience in covert operation. United States possess the state of the art technology and equipment. United States has a strong conviction of Trump administration's denuclearization of North Korea, all those things, capabilities for covert operation. Both countries can uh, cooperate uh, for this one. Lastly, in terms of the covert operation implementation, I want to uh, say one principle. Nowadays, the Mujain government and the Trump government, in terms of quality, actually they are different. This is the precondition is the top secret for the covert operations. So if South Korea and the United States agreed 100% perfectly, we can apply covert op operation. But if they don't have 100% perfectly, uh, uh, they cannot apply this one. So United States or South Korea alone should do these covert, covert operations. Next, they disable North Korean nuclear weapon manufacturing materials and uh, uh, missile manufacturing materials, I also may, uh, described in terms of uh, five things mentioned above. And uh, lastly, disabling North Korea core people related to nuclear weapons, the core people, firstly, the Kim Jong-un, and nextly, specialists uh, relating to nuclear development program or missile development programs. So for this one, United States and the uh, Republic of Korea should cooperate. For example, for the acquisition and the analysis of information, there are dozens of the Kim Jong Un's residence in North Korea. Already 14 have been known. Among them, Yongsan residence is the central one. That could be main target. And the uh, United States had a strong capabilities for gathering the information. For example, Apple's uh, their voice recognition uh, technologies, Apple's, Siri, Microsoft, Contana, uh, Contana, Amazon's Alexa, Google's Google Assistant, uh, new technologies, uh, text-dependent algorithm, and the text-independent algorithm. We can mobilize the, for this one, for civilian or public one. So this, uh, the North Korea's nuclear and the missile export, uh, we have already uh, known over 120 or something like that. Among them, Zhang Chang'e, Zheng Yiro, Yu Jin, Mi Jung, Kim Jong Sik. Those people are important figures among them. There could be main target to disable uh, this. There. Uh, we try to accurate, uh, getting accurate information for the type of residence, residential area, situation of commuting and the traffic, etc. There is a so-called six-lane avenue in Pyongyang, known as the future scientist state. This uh, could be where we should discuss each other. This could be the main target or not. The next one, forward operation specific topic selection. The next one, forward operation decision making. Next one, for the ability of covert operations and uh, how we can uh, do implementation for covert operation. United States, uh, Republic of Korea can cooperate uh, each other. Nextly, I like summary and conclusions. Firstly, North Korea regime 
if North Korea regime uh, no change qualitatively, and the United States keep strong belief, in this case we can apply the covert operation. Second, there are three missions objective of covert operation already I mentioned, disabling existing North Korean nuclear weapons and nuclear facilities, disabling North Korean nuclear weapons and missile manufacturing materials, disabling North Korean core people related to the nuclear weapons. There are five areas that can cooperate in the US ROK alliance. First one, acquisition and analysis of information. Second, covert operation specific target selection. Third one, covert operation decision making, also ability of covert operation. Fifth one, covert operation implementations. Then, in terms of implement, in, implementation of covert operation, if both country agreed 100% perfect, in this case, we can apply covert operation. If there is a, uh, some percentage disagreement, we cannot apply this one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Uh, well, the, uh, uh, he w worked in a special uh, just the uh, uh, purpose command actually uh, the uh, military defense military security command as a chief of staff. So. Um, he has pre for the uh, uh, the good background in um, observing this security uh, uh, operations. Uh, okay, next well, uh, we invite the uh, uh, very special uh, the speaker, uh, the uh, George Hutchinson. Um, he has background to observe the Korean problem from the bottom side and to the theoretical level. Uh, so uh, we'll uh, listen to uh, the, uh, uh, him, uh, the uh, uh, more balanced one, or just the, the background of the Korean nuclear issues. And from that background, uh, I, I'm looking forward to listening. Well, uh, here's the, uh, the, the, uh, his uh, uh, strategy, how to resolve this problem, OK? The, uh, Please give him a big hand. The, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, General Kim. Thank you, General Talelli, General Sharp. Uh, it's a real pleasure. It's an honor to be here at the 33rd conference. And uh, so, just getting started, I want to, I want to first operationalize the phrase, the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, because odds are that. <laughs> As part of a completely denuclearized Korean Peninsula, North Korea's expectation would include, most likely, removing South Korea from the U.S. nuclear umbrella. But South Korea is not the reason that the peninsula is currently nuclearized. The Korean Peninsula has been nuclear nuclearized, as, as General Kim pointed out earlier, for about 60 years now. Uh, and that was really beginning with the U.S. stockpiling of tactical warheads in South Korea from 1958 to 1991, during which time South Korea explored, uh, it briefly pursued its own program of nuclear weapons from the late 1960s until about 1976, when it abandoned the program due to intense U.S. pressure. But when the U.S. committed to withdrawing its nuclear weapons and ultimately removed all nuclear weapons from the peninsula by 1991, North Korea was really just ramping up its program. And, and it was embarking, frankly, on one of the greatest shell game cons ever perpetrated on the international community. So North Korea is the reason that the Korean Peninsula currently remains nuclearized. So complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, which North Korea agreed to, at both the April and the June summits is synonymous with denuclearization of North Korea. Verifiably and irreversibly, and on paper anyway, Kim Jong-un appears to be going along with this whole thing. In fact, in the joint declaration signed in the April summit between President Moon and Kim Jong-un, both Koreans agreed to actively seek the support and cooperation of the international community 
but a denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So, well, this is exactly what the international community is trying to do since way back, since at least 1992. And that's to get North Korea to cooperate on denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. The international community's role has been to implement and enforce inspections and verification of North Korea's denuclearization. And when North Korea has been has acted in, in bad faith, then the international community's role has been to step in and implement and enforce sanctions to counter North Korea's nuclear moves. And again, this goes back to the early 90s. This goes back to when Hans Blix led the International Atomic Energy Agency and worked to try and bring North Korea into compliance with safeguards inspections of its nuclear facilities. So this has going, been going on for quite some time. But despite efforts across several U.S. presidents and over two decades of increased collaboration among the international community, North Korea has dodged inspections rather masterfully, sidestepped sanctions rather artfully, and succeeded in developing an arsenal of nuclear weapons, all in defiance of the international community that North Korea now seeks support and cooperation from. So how has the international community contributed toward denuclearization? Oh, uh, here we go. So how has the international community contributed toward denuclear, denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula, and what will its role be in moving forward to ensure the complete verifiable dismantlement of North Korea's nuclear program? Well, first, I'd like to delineate between efforts to negotiate with North Korea and efforts by the international community to denuclearize North Korea. And they're different, really. And efforts to negotiate with North Korea have largely been U.S.-led going back as far as the Bush 41 administration, George H. W. Bush, a primary role of the U.S. during that time in, in moving forward vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korean denuclearization has been to negotiate with North Korea to get Pyongyang to cease nu nuclear activity and adhere to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, and IAEA inspections and monitoring. The international community, the international medium through which efforts to rein in North Korea's compliance with inspections and monitoring has primarily been the United Nations, more specifically the UN Security Council and its subsidiary organs. And it's here, through this international medium, where the U.S. and the international community have been successful at building incremental pressures on North Korea, formation of the 1718 Sanctions Committee in 2006, panel of experts in 2009, and then last year, passage of three of the hardest hitting sanctions ever imposed on North Korea. But the U.S., well, well there, have, there have been some successes incrementally increasing pressures. The U.S. has failed miserably at negotiating a successful agreement with North Korea that ensures Pyongyang's compliance with inspection and verification of its nuclear program. And for the Trump administration, this is exactly what's currently on the table. Another shot at negotiations. Negotiations to get North Korea to verifiably comply with denuclearizing. So now to be clear, the Trump administration has operated differently thus far from previous administrations. To put it mildly, the three previous administrations all used a negotiating approach that ultimately fell apart at some point. The Clinton, Bush, and Obama administrations each looked to the State Department initially and chose seasoned diplomats at the Assistant Secretary of State level, and, and, and they led a bottom-up sort of negotiation process. And it's reasonable to assess that North Korea, maybe during the Clinton administration, was, was a little baffled at first, but it, North Korea probably found this U.S. negotiating tactic to be highly predictable and susceptible to the constraints of the presidential clock. Each previous administration started out resolute, even uncompromising, tough, only to crumple later on in the negotiating process. Each time, as North Korea stalled and maneuvered, applying brinkmanship tactics and conducting provocations, the U.S. eventually softened its negotiating approach in order to come up with some form of a tangible diplomatic achievement. And then as time wound down in these previous administrations, North Korea worked the clock masterfully, foiling negotiations, avoiding inspections, <laughs> while advancing its nuclear program. Now, it's possible that the Trump administration gets trapped in a similar cycle if Kim Jong-un maintains North Korea's decades-old tactics. But it will only be possible if the international community fails to enforce sanctions 
and the Trump administration takes the negotiating bait and falls for the tactics. And deviating from maximum pressure to soften the current negotiating atmosphere, which the Trump administration seems to have done to some degree already, is a dangerous first step towards taking that negotiating bait. So now, while the U.S. has failed to negotiate a successful agreement with North Korea, it has, uh, as I said, it, it's, it succeeded in working with the international community, and frankly, primarily beginning with the Bush 43 administration, George W. Bush administration. It's here we see an incremental build to put the tools in place that are now available to the international community. It's been a very, very slow process, but the tools have been put in place for the international community to use for enforcing sanctions targeting North Korea. The Bush administration launched a number of international initiatives, to their credit, beginning with the multinational six-party process to deal with North Korea, albeit ineffective at producing an, ad an adhered upon or an adhered to agreement in the end, but it was effective at establishing multinational channels of collaboration, particularly with China and through the United Nations. Now, in 2003, the Bush administration engineered the Proliferation Security Initiative, the PSI. John Bolton, the U.S. Undersecretary of State for Arms Control and International Security at the time, and of course now the National Security Advisor, had a lot to do with that. He was the architect of PSI at its inception. The U.S. worked with 10 countries on the project, and there's over 100 states now that endorsed the PSI's interdiction principles. Just recently, PSI has been re-energized re through coordinated surveillance and interdiction operations in the Pacific. It's being led by the Japanese, it's being hosted by the Japanese, and it's being, uh, there's, there's five or six countries that are currently participating. Um, but perhaps the most effective tool employed by the Bush administration was Section 311 of the Patriot Act. The Treasury Department used Section 311 to go after suspected North Korean money laundering and counterfeiting at Banco Delta Asia in 2005, and this triggered Macau regulators to step in and freeze $25 million in North Korean accounts with a ripple effect that put pressures on banks throughout the world. But most important, it exposed one of North Korea's greatest vulnerabilities, and that is cash, and cash particularly belonging to the North Korean elite. And it was after North Korea's first nuclear test in 2006, and with John Bolton, now installed as the UN, U.S. ambassador to the U.N., that the U.N. Security Council unanimously adopted Resolution 1718, established the 1718 Sanctions Committee to monitor and adjust sanctions going forward in North Korea, marking the beginning of an international sanctions regime. Now, the Obama administration also coordinated some international successes as well and picked up where the Bush administration left off, primarily with counterproliferation finance activities. During the Obama administration, we see, we begin to see the global financial system align with measures specified in the UN Security Council provisions. After North Korea's second nuclear test in 2009, the UN Security Council unanimously passed 1874, Resolution 1874, which further tightened sanctions on North Korea, but, but more important, it established a panel of experts, expert resources in place to support and advise the 1718 Sanctions Committee. And then after North Korea's third nuclear test in 2013, the UN Security Council unanimously, unanimously passed Resolution 2094. And this was the first UN resolution to comprehensively target North Korea's illicit finances. It requires UN member states to freeze or block any financial tra transactions or money transfers deemed to be helping North Korea's illicit activities in the, in the nuclear space. Now, after this resolution was passed, the Obama administration took action to try and recreate the same type of scenario felt by North Korea in 2005 with the Treasury Department's Section 311 of the Patriot Act, the uh, Bank, of, Bank of Delta Asia Advisory. And they went after the uh, North Korea's foreign trade bank, the FTB, and it was effective. The Obama administration tried to get other countries to, to go on board with that, and they did, uh, including China. Now, back in 2010, North Korea started showing up 
on the Financial Activities Task Force Blacklist, the FATF Blacklist, but only as a risk to the international financial system. The FATF is the intergovernmental body charged with combating money laundering and terrorist financing. Highly influential, it advises countries and financial institutions on threats in order to protect the international financial system. The FATF continued to intensify its blacklist language against North Korea and align its advisories with UN sanctions measures. By 2016, the FATF began referencing UN Security Council sanctions, urging global financial jurisdictions to terminate relationships and close North Korean banks within their territories in accordance with relevant UN Security Council resolutions. But despite UN sanctions and growing international efforts to target North Korea's financial activities with, with these new tools, North Korea's nuclear program accelerated in 2016, as we all know, with the country conducting two nuclear tests and numerous ballistic missile launches. Now, since President Trump has been in office, up until the Singapore summit, anyway, the administration had worked effectively to coordinate even more international support in applying pressure on Pyongyang. Since the Trump administration has taken office, we've seen the international community and the global financial system align, align even more tightly with measures specified in UN Security Council resolutions and target North Korea. In other words, what's been put in these resolutions now, you, you start seeing these global organizations start to send out the advisories and start to comply with the mandates that are in the provisions. 2017, U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley worked to successfully obtain three unanimously adopted U.N. Security Council resolutions, sanctions with big teeth that target North Korean imports and exports of strategic commodities and provide additional tools to help countries counter North Korea's illicit maritime activities. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin has used newly designated authorities for secondary sanctions targeting third-party entities financing or trading with North Korea. We've seen several rounds of this in the last several months alone. In November 2017, the FATF once again intensified its blacklist language against North Korea and urged specific implementation of several key UN Security Council resolution provisions intended to disrupt North Korea's illicit financial activities. Importantly, the, the UN Panel of Experts released a hard-hitting report in 2017 detailing North Korea's sanctions evading techniques. These reports from the panel of experts from 2009 on have gotten better, more precise. They're at a point now where they're detailing the activities and being coordinated and proved with, with China, detailing North Korea's sanctions evading activities. It's continued access to the financial banking systems. And deep inside this report, the panel found that the SWIFT the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication. The SWIFT, this is their integral to the international financial system, provides global financing messaging services to financial institutions located throughout the globe. The report found that the SWIFT was in violation of UN asset freeze provisions because it was providing services to North Korean banks designated in UN Security Council resolutions. Due to the panel's report in March 9th, 2017, SWIFT stopped providing financial services to North Korean banks designated under, under the provisions. So while the coordinated pressure campaign did not stop North Korea from launching ICBMs or conducting its nuclear test in September last year, the pressure seems to have given rise to and possibly helped force engagement. The maximum pressure campaign can be given a good deal of credit for North Korea's decision to finally suspend its, north, its nuclear program and open itself to engagement. And in striking ways, President Trump, the international community, and President Moon have, have, have been effectively aligned under the banner of the Trump administration's maximum pressure and engagement campaign in almost kind of a good cop, bad cop sort of way. You've got uh, you see this working effectively right through the 27 April summit and then right up until the 12 June summit. A few days after North Korea agreed to attend the Winter Olympics on 12 January, the U.S. and 16 other members of the Proliferation Security Initiative 
released a joint statement in support of enforcing UN Secur Security Council resolutions and provisions requiring maritime interdictions of North Korea. And this is happening in parallel. A few days after that, in, uh, in January in Vancouver, Canada and the U.S. hosted 20 nations, 16 former United Nations countries that originally fought with South Korea in the Korean War, with an additional four, South Korea, Japan, India, and Sweden. That meeting focused on additional ways to further pressure North Korea and strengthen global maritime interdictions against the country. On 5 March, the day before the April summit before President Moon and Kim Jong-un was announced, the UN panel of experts released perhaps its toughest report ever, chastising the international community. The report lauded the international community's efforts to increase new measures and produce new tools to thwart North Korea, but noted that efforts had yet to be matched by the requisite political will, international coordination, prioritization, and resource allocation necessary to drive effective implementation of the sanctions. And then on April 28th, the day after the historic inter-Korean summit in Panmunjom, Japan's Foreign Ministry of Foreign Affairs announced an expanded PSI and addiction effort in the Pacific involving aircraft and ships from Japan, the US, the UK, Australia, and Canada. And this operation is currently ongoing. So, since the Singapore summit, the Trump administration has sent mixed signals about its resolve to continue applying maximum pressure on North Korea. Ultimately, the success of denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula will be measured on whether or not North Korea completely dismantles its nuclear program. To increase the probability that this happens, the Trump administration and the international community must maintain pressure and enforce all sanctions on North Korea to keep progress towards denuclearization on track. It's far too early in the process for the international community to take its foot off the pedal of pressure. Only after swiftly agreed on timelines and milestones are met or be even begin to get met should even the slightest bit of pressure be taken off of North Korea. This will be difficult particularly in the current atmosphere of conciliation, and especially with countries like China, who have been ambivalent from the start about enforcing UN sanctions against North Korea. Nonetheless, the US will have to work hard with its international partners to keep up pressure and continue to refine enforcement procedures. Fortunately, the tools are on the table. The tools are on the table for the international community to be able to do this, thanks in large part to the incremental efforts of the UN Security Council, its subsidiary organs, the 1718 Sanctions Committee, the panel of experts, other ongoing international activities that are taken by organizations like the FATF and the SWIFT, and culminating in multinational efforts like the one we're currently seeing with the expanded PSI operation in the Pacific. If North Korea is serious about wanting the international community's help with denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula, then it should finally agree to adhere to verifiable inspections and proceed expeditiously and in good faith. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, well, it is so tricky issue. So we need to investigate the problem very carefully uh, from the observation uh, from the east and west, and from the bottom and uh, from the top. Okay, now we'll invite the uh, one very excellent discussant, the uh, uh, Andrew Scobell, graduate of the Columbia University, and also the, uh, his work uh, for Rand Corporation in Washington office, and the, uh, also uh, he uh, is China expert, actually, I know. So the uh, he will have with the, uh, uh, the, the, the very accurate observation on this issue. Please the, uh, give him a big hand to invite him to discuss. This works. Works. Testing, testing. Um, thank you, John. Um, I, I have observations. Whether they're accurate, that's for other people to decide. Um, 
this, uh, I think we have two very thoughtful, uh, thorough, and uh, systematic uh, papers. One focused on history, the other uh, focused on uh, the covert uh, option. Neither paper, interestingly, uh, looks at the nuts and bolts of what uh, many people uh, think of as denuclearization. And, and that's, of course, uh, the why, why do both, uh, neither paper look specifically at this, but I think because both authors are quite skeptical uh, that uh, the agreements uh, signed um, in, uh, in Panmunjom and in, uh, in, in Singapore will actually be, uh, 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 that the North Koreans will actually follow, follow through on those, uh, on those agreements. Uh, in, in some ways, I think uh, both, uh, both presenters are, are, are uh, uh, pessimists slash optimists. Uh, Pessimists in the sense uh, that uh, both uh, both uh, paper writers uh, are are not uh, are not uh, very optimistic about uh, uh, thing, uh, previous uh, efforts or current efforts being successful, uh, but then they're also I think optimistic, perhaps too optimistic, uh, that their uh, proposed alternatives will work. So you know, how, how likely is it that a covert operation will be successful, or uh, I think realistically a series of covert operations would be successful? Um, you know, what if they're partially successful? Uh, what, what would the North Korean response be? Uh, uh, it, it's a little frightening uh, to think about uh, if, it's, uh, if, if these covert operations are not successful. <coughs> Uh, then looking at uh, uh, the, the other paper, diplomacy. Both I think both uh, presenters agree that uh, or, or concur that uh, in their view diplomacy hasn't worked. Uh, so uh, the other the other presenter uh, suggests that uh, sanctions are the answer, and sanctions have been quite uh, uh, quite successful. Or I don't think you specifically said this, but. It was implicit that what has brought the North Koreans to the table, uh, or, or to uh, uh, just in recent in recent months, it's been the effectiveness of the sanctions. Uh, so, but will I think that's the the likelihood of sanctions alone being successful uh, is. is is a doubtful a, a doubtful proposition uh, in in my mind. So. Rightly being skeptical about the, the success of uh, current uh, or, or on current initiatives, but I think being perhaps overly optimistic that their preferred solution uh, will will uh, solve uh, solve the problem. As all three uh, speakers uh, pointed out, uh, panelists, uh, there are different understandings of what we actually mean what is denuclearization. Different understandings in terms of what the North Koreans think uh, about this uh, versus what uh, US and other, other uh, South Koreans and others uh, think about this. And also thinking about what do we mean by the process of denuclearization. Uh, it's not synonymous, uh, as, as George mentioned, with, with uh, the simply signing agreements uh, and, and having negotiations, the actual implementation, uh, best case scenario, the actual implementation, execution of uh, uh, denuclearization would be an incredibly tortuous and, and extended effort. Again, this is assuming the North Koreans are sincere and, and, and willing to follow through. And uh, you know, experts like Sig Hecker have, 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 have identified in painstaking fashion the, the processes and things that need to happen in order for uh, uh, denuclearization uh, to occur, assuming, as I said, that the North Koreans are, uh, are willing, uh, are, are sincere about uh, uh, following, uh, following through on this. But neither, I think, neither covert operations or uh, you know, uh, maximum pressure uh, sanctions are, are, are a silver bullet. Uh, while I certainly uh, believe uh, that uh, 
that, that uh, President Reagan was right when he said trust but verify because he was talking about the Soviet Union. This time we're talking about uh, actually another Stalinist state. So maybe it's uh, not so, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's quite apt. We need to, we need to uh, make sure that the North Koreans are, uh, are following through on their commitments. So we need to be tough. Uh, we need to threaten punishments. But we also need to, in addition to sticks, we need to offer carrots. So we can't lose sight of that. Uh, uh, but we don't want to give the whole carrot up front before, uh, before the, uh, uh, the North, we verify that the North Koreans have, uh, have held up, upheld their, their, their end of the bargain. Um, so the, the question, I think the key question is, uh, and I was, Last month, I was in China conducting interviews uh, with uh, a variety of uh, civilian and military uh, analysts uh, in multiple cities. And the consensus, there were mixed views, um, but the consensus was, and I think this is wish, perhaps wishful thinking or following the party line, is that you know, this time it's different. This time, we have a new leader in North Korea. He's serious about denuclearization. Conditions are, uh, are conducive. We believe he's serious. And oh, by the way, you Americans, you need to, 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 to you know, you're critical in making, moving this process forward. But there were some uh, who, uh, who I uh, spoke with who were much more, much more skeptical uh, and uh, didn't think there was uh, much likelihood of this. So the, the fundamental question then is, is this, uh, is uh, Kim Jong-un's initi diplomatic initiatives and seasons of summit, season of, it's a season of summits, uh, you know, uh, a plethora of propaganda, positive propaganda, I better stop while my alliteration uh, I'm ahead, uh, is that, does that represent a strategic uh, initiative by North Korea, or is this purely tactical? So have we seen this movie before? You know, this is not the first time, as many people in this room and the panelists well know, that North, Korean, uh, North Korea has made these kinds of commitments. So what's different this time? Is it strategic or is it tactical? I would suggest, of course, the answer is we don't know yet. We need to follow through. But here's my question to, to all the panelists, uh, and questioned, you know, wh at what point do we make the determination uh, that it is a strategic, that, 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 that the North Koreans are serious this time, or that they're just playing us once again? At what point? And, and so I'd ask the, the panelists to think about, in terms of a, t a time frame, you know, will it take months? Uh, you know, will we know in a few weeks? Will it take years? And, and, and a specific milestones, you know, in terms of specific milestones. Um, maybe, that's, maybe the answer is pretty easy, but I think we need to be uh, thinking about at what point uh, do we, uh, will we call North Korea's bluff, so to speak. Uh, you know, yesterday, um, the Korean uh, Red Devils uh, played a superb game. <laughs> they defeated the world champions, and they knocked them out of the World Cup. Who would have, nobody could have imagined this was possible, right? So here's my, here, here's my point. Um, we need to hope for the best, prepare for the worst, but we also need to dare to be audacious. I mean, in other words, it's possible. It's unlikely. I'm a skeptic, uh, but it's, it's possible that this might actually, the North Koreans might actually be serious. So we need to move forward uh, with that possibility in mind and, and be ambitious and press them, press the North Koreans to move forward in, in, a, in a timely fashion and not uh, avoid, uh, avoid the, uh, channel, avoid the uh, likelihood <laughs> Uh, the real likelihood that they're going to draw this thing out and draw this thing out, and that will break the coalition, uh, uh, the, the uh, you know, international coalition, and make sanctions, you know, a tough sanction regime, uh, very difficult if not impossible. And then the the covert issue, you know, politicians, 
God brought them, um, will drag this thing, will also be extremely reluctant uh, to give the green light to, to the covert, uh, covert option. So I'll stop there uh, and uh, uh, thank again the paper, uh, paper writers for his two excellent papers. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, the uh, very good point. Even though the pro probability is the, uh, very tiny, nevertheless, uh, we should pay attention on that. And well, even though North Korea started to cheat, to cheat the, uh, uh, our intention, nevertheless, make it to do it uh, as he started, it's the, uh, our just the uh, strategy. Very good point. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me present one uh, just the uh, professor from Korea University. He's actually uh, working uh, in the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Korea University in uh, political science department um, and graduate of the University of Chicago. Okay, well, yeah, let's give him a big hand. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to be uh, balanced in everything I do, so I prepare three comments for each presentation. Um, I start with uh, my comments on Dr. Song's presentation on paper. Uh, here's the first one. Um, Dr. Song argues that disarming North Korea is an issue of life and death. Basically, his view is that you either, we either um, disarm North Korea or die. So this desperate situation um, calls for extreme measures. For example, you know, some optimists would argue that we need to try uh, some, um, you know, extreme uh, diplomacy, like, you know, providing asymmetric concessions. Uh, to lure North Korea into the path of uh, denuclearization. But on the other hand, uh, people like uh, Dr. Song actually proposes uh, extreme forceful measures, including covert operation um, that targets you know, core individuals as well as core nuclear facilities. So this is a time of maximum this and maximum that. But I don't like extremes. I like more balanced approach. There is a third option, which is far more moderate and makes more strategic sense, which is deterrence. Even if Pyongyang develops Credible nuclear second strike capabilities, Washington would still be able to deter their use against the United States and so with its superior nuclear conventional forces. Let me tell you about the history. There's no historical case in which a nuclear armed great power or its ally under its nuclear umbrella has been ever attacked, came under a nuclear attack. There's none. So why do you start thinking that it's different you know, when it comes to North Korea with nuclear weapons? I think deterrence will work. Not automatically, but if we put enough efforts to strengthen our you know, deterrence postures and capabilities together. That's my first, first point. And second point. Um, maybe I'm misreading uh, Dr. Song's argument, but um, I, I got the impression from reading his paper that he suggests that um, it might be a good idea for Washington to go it alone because it's difficult to be on the same page 100% when it comes to that uh, controversial covert operation. But I think that might be a bad idea in the long run and when we look at the big picture. Um, if the United States decides to conduct 
risky covered operations unilaterally without any consultation with the Blue House or over its objection and they are reviewed, then the Blue House and South Korean publics would reject and doubt U.S. trust warnings. The fact that the White House made such a grave decision to put, you know, Korean lives at you know, great risk without, you know, consulting our government or just over our government's objection, South Koreans will not be able to trust the United States more anymore. And the consequence would be the weakening of the ROK-US alliance, and I, I would deplore that. Because this might be a risk worth, not worth taking when strong alliance cooperation becomes ever more important vis-a-vis -vis an assertive right in China. That would be the biggest concern down the road shared by the United States and South Korea. And in an effort to disarm you know, North Korea, you don't want to jeopardize our valuable alliance that can do much good down the road vis-a-vis -vis the right in China. Here's my third comment. Um, actually, uh, Dr. Song did not talk about this very much in his presentation, but he, uh, you know, uh, describes and you know um, suggests an attempt to remove Kim Jong Un, and I don't think that would succeed. Uh, because locating and striking a top national leader in real time is nearly impossible. Just tell me, give me just one example of success. I'm not talking about, you know, IES leaders. I'm not talking about Qaeda leaders, but top national leader. Have you ever succeeded? And um, modern history has witnessed, witnessed few such successful decapitation operations. Also, Kim's death might not lead to Pyongyang's giving up nuclear capabilities at all. There is a good chance that his successor would be insecure and would need the military's loyalty, would want to hold on to North Korea's nuclear deterrence. Decapitation rarely changes national policy. There is a good literature on this. Moreover, a revealed attempt for assassination, whether successful or abortive, can bring about a determined, deadly retaliation by North Korea. Dr. Song talked much about the covert operation capabilities in our hands. But think about you know, the, the covert operations, assets, and capabilities in Pyongyang's hands. It's horrible. They can assassinate our poor people, and they can assassinate, you know, Americans living in Seoul and South Korea. Okay, let me move on to uh, my comments on Dr. Uh, Hutchinson's paper. Here's the first one. Um, Dr. Hutchinson uh, said in his paper that, uh, quote, Kim Jong-un moved to freeze his nuclear program, end quote, after an ICBM test of November 29, 2017. And I think this claim is a little bit of mistaken, even though your historical account is very accurate in general. Okay, here's why. Pyongyang can further develop and produce nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles without additional tests for some time. Since it already conducted numerous tests and thereby accumulated technical data over the past couple of years, equating nuclear development with over tests or equating test suspension with program freeze is misguided. And there is a misconception on the dash, you know, prevalent type, uh, um, which doesn't make much sense. My second comment. Um, this is my view uh, on North Korea's intention, which is very hard to read. 
equip it. But I think it's possible that North Korea's conciliatory words and actions towards Seoul and Washington in recent months are no more than gambits or baits primarily aiming to ease Chinese sanctions implementation and improve the DPRK PRC relations. We tend to believe that their the purpose, the primary targets of North Korean diplomatic initiatives are us, the United States, and South Korea. I don't think that's the case. It's more likely that from the beginning, what Pyongyang wanted is to ease Chinese implementation of sanctions. How to do that? It's very simple. By pleasing Beijing. Do what it wants. What did Beijing want? Nuclear talks. Inter-Korean dialogues. Suspension of nuclear tests and suspension of military exercises. And that's, those are what Pyongyang have been getting for Beijing for the past couple of months. And no wonder Beijing is happy and very willing to ease the implementation of economic sanctions. And let me highlight this. Why do this? China, why does China want to ease you know, the, the implementation of sanctions? I think there's a very simple answer to that. To buy some time and get some money to develop its second strike capability and uh, put its economic development back <coughs> on track. And exactly that's what Pyongyang has been getting money and time. Okay? And people talk about seriousness of <coughs> North Korean intention. I, I, I just don't like talking about a nation's intention. First of all, it's unobservable. It's uncertain. Second, even if it's observable, it's changeable. North Korea can be, Kim Jong un might be serious, you know, this day, but he might be not tomorrow. So you, you, you don't, in diplomacy, you don't trust an other state <coughs> leader's intention. What you trust is the situation in which that leader is in. And North Korea, Kim Jong-un was in exactly the situation in which he wanted to ease the implementation of economic sanction. And since now he's getting exactly that, more and more, he's becoming less and less serious about denuclearizing you know, the Korean peninsula when it comes to CPID. It's specific. Thanks for listening. Okay. Uh, um, before we open this discussion to the floor, the, uh, I would like to give time to, uh, to the presenter to respond to the uh, discussions. Um, well, just the, uh, uh, I uh, would like to convey a very the important uh, message from the, uh, my Korean colleague. We have very old general who participated in the Korean War, actually the uh, hero of the Korean War, named Pek sun -yeop. He is to be now the uh, 98 years old. Uh, one day he said that the, uh, every inch of the land in South Korea uh, has been defended by the uh, pain blood of the young blood of the Korean U.S. youngsters. Uh, whenever he uh, just the, uh, uh, passes June, uh, he recalls the Korean War when he defended uh, the uh, Korean uh, territory from the North Korean attack. Uh, I might convey this message to you, especially to my good friend, the General Tuoli and the General Shah. Um, well, See, uh, 
we really don't know the, what the real intent of the, uh, the uh, Kim Jong-un. And it is very uh, hard to know the inside of the North Korean territory. Uh, but well, uh, what we know is, well, it's pretty much consistent. Uh, well, the, uh, because uh, Kim Jong-un cannot uh, give up the, his father's strategy or policy. And his father, Kim Jong-il, but could not deny his father's the, uh, uh, the heritage. Uh, so it's the, the regime uh, moves pretty consistently. It's predictable, in a sense, more predictable than the one from the free world. So, uh, well, as the, uh, the was discussed, the, the argument, uh, uh, we need to uh, the, uh, assess not only the intention, but also capability together. Okay, let me listen to, let us listen to the, uh, the presenter's response to the discussions. Uh, first, the uh, general, uh, then uh, Dr. Song. Thank you for, to Professor uh, comment. Uh, first, is Gobert's comment. Uh, you mentioned uh, now is the time uh, we cannot sure be sure uh, it's a strategic changes or tactical changes. Uh, that is, uh, so we can uh, choose uh, optimistic view or pessimistic view. Right? So uh, for the national security, we prepare uh, all the cases. So this is, uh, I like the optimistic view. Uh, anyway, uh, we should prepare the pessimistic views. You know? So uh, I chose this, uh, my paper's the topic. Uh, I focus on the covert operations. Uh, so we should wait for, uh, uh, in the future, uh, the North Korea uh, will change it or not. So I have uh, four standards uh, to check whether the North Korea regime will change it or not. The first one, first one, political system. North Korea political system is, uh, is a rare case for the dictatorship authoritarian dictatorship, uh, in a sense, the whole nation is the uh, uh, military society. Uh, if they want to change qualitatively, uh, the political system should be changed. And the next one, uh, the character of North Korea regime, uh, we evaluated, so enigmatic regime. Uh, it's, uh, we cannot predict uh, even though they uh, argue the some kind of things, we cannot predict the That's the, his, uh, the North Korea's history. So I am checking that uh, we can predict the country's the argument or behavior. So still, we don't have any evidence uh, toward that. It's an enigmatic regime. The third, one, third standard is, uh, anyway, that's uh, the most valuable national policy is a military policy. So there is no evidence to change that one. Without changing their military uh, first policy, uh, we don't expect uh, denuclearization for the North Korea. So finally, North Korea's final goal toward the South Korea is the unification under uh, their regimes. So uh, we are taking that one. The concrete example, after the Saudi meeting in Panmunjom, First, they argued uh, we have some uh, North Korean members, they worked in a restaurant in China. Uh, they chose their freedom. Then uh, I expected uh, many uh, uh, optimistic uh, things. But the first, they argued, OK, return uh, the workers uh, in, uh, the, uh, the restaurants. They choose their freedoms. They are so uh, now uh, still uh, they hadn't changed anything. So I am checking that one. So if really uh, I want to measure uh, with my standards, if uh, there are some changes under this standard, okay, uh, I will choose optimistic or pessimistic one. So I completely agree. Uh, this is the time strategic change or uh, tactical change. My view 
is the tactical change. Uh, this is my opinion. point. Thank you for Dr. Lee. Uh, you also mentioned uh, uh, you don't like extreme views. Also, I don't like extreme views. Uh, we, however, uh, for the national security, we should prepare all the cases, optimistic case, extreme pessimistic case. So this is a pessimistic uh, case. You know, so, uh, and another one, uh, without uh, Washington or without Seoul, uh, if we do, if we do implement a board covert operation, that is a bad idea. Then, uh, for the national security, national security is not the consulting business. Uh, sometimes uh, we should do alone. Sometimes we can cooperate each other. So this is national security. Uh, so the covert operations uh, characteristic is sometimes uh, we can do alone. Uh, so uh, uh, we need uh, sometimes cooperation, sometimes we should do alone. Uh, that means uh, we need a uh, top secret for the covert operation. So I suggest that, uh, that idea. And uh, you mentioned uh, if we do covert operation, uh, toward the North Korea. There, uh, there are North Korea's horrible retaliations. Yes, I know, but uh, uh, three years ago, I did interview uh, over 100 North Korean defectors. They are all former um, North Korean military soldiers. Uh, and uh, one by one interview, uh, the question is, uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, society uh, did you live before uh, to enter the uh, army or navy or air force? Uh, how about your family circumstances? How long time did you serve in the North Korean army? What kind of job did you work in the army? And uh, why did you uh, choose uh, to uh, South Korea? Uh, uh, and uh, what, do, uh, what are you thinking in South Korean society? I ask uh, such kind of questions. My conclusion is so many North Korean former army dictators, they mentioned North Korean army has a number of weaknesses that are virtually unknown to the outside world. And uh, they are subject to preemptive attacks and the retaliation having many problems. For the retaliation, they have many problems. Why South Korea so much fears about the North Korean military powers? So whole interviews, they argue the company that one. So uh, through the propaganda uh, of the, the North Korea, uh, we appear, uh, uh, we are persuaded uh, so much uh, by the propaganda. So uh, we should check more details. Uh, that is a topic uh, to analyze uh, with the cooperation between the United States and the South Korea. Thank you. So I, let me just address, uh, Dr. Lee raises an excellent point, and that is, and, and for anyone that's, that's familiar with a, a DOD weapons acquisition program, the, the North Korea North Korea's missiles program is essentially it's a, it's a weapon system acquisition program. And, and so Dr. Lee's point was the fact that there hasn't been a launch since November, there hasn't been a nuclear test, doesn't mean the program is frozen. Well, of course it depends on what, what is it definitely. There's a newspaper de definition of frozen, which is synonymous with there's no more launches, there's nothing in the news. But Dr. Lee's point is exactly right. There's a conceptual phase, there's a, a research and development phase, there's a production fielding deployment sustainment phase, and it keeps going on and on and on. And, and North Korea's program certainly is not dormant. It's, it's, uh, it's probably in some form of production and, and fielding as, as we speak. Uh, and just because they're not conducting launches doesn't mean the program doesn't exist. So excellent point, and, and that's a bit, a bit of laziness we fall into sometimes when we're, when we're quoting Reuters, but uh, 
So, and then uh, the other point on China's easing of sanctions, I think is an excellent point as well. And it kind of goes to the, the point I was making at the end of the paper, and that is that the effort really now is that, as the panel of experts pointed out in the last report, it isn't so much coming up with a newfangled sanction. They're out there. The sanctions are out there. All the implementing provisions are out there. All the advisories are out there. All the international organizations, the global nodes that exist in a network of trying to get North Korea to stop nuclearization, it's out there. It's a matter of enforcement. And the Chinese have been, they've been reluctant to really put the pedal to the metal in, to begin with, but now this eases things a little bit more. But not just China. I'd have to broaden that. I'd, ha I'd have to say that this, this mood of conciliation is, is far more expansive than, than just China. It's going to involve Russia. It's going to involve third flag, fourth flag, fifth flag countries that are, that are floating out there with, with dinghies, you know, carrying cargo back and forth. And that's what makes this proliferation security initiative important. Um, to Dr. Scoble's uh, question, and that was, what did we need to do in terms of the nuts and bolts of actually sitting down and trying to figure out how to denuclearize? I, you know, that, that's going to, those are details, timeline specific infrastructure to target, milestones, things to adhere to, uh, what, to what to dismantle and when. That's, that's going to, theoretically, that'll be worked out, but it should be very aggressive. Because what we don't know is what we don't know. And, and we don't know how extent, we don't know how pervasive and, and widespread the infrastructure is in that country. We, we know where Young Gun is, but that's probably the extent of it. Now, I'm, I'm sure overhead intelligence will get involved in informing the United Nations and, and help the IAEA in their, in their efforts to try and monitor and verify. But North Korea, I think the stipulation should be open up. And any, any sign of the shell games or, or any sign of the silliness that, that we've had to endure over the last several decades is probably something that should be taken off the table immediately. And then I think there was another question um, about, you asked another question. Oh, yeah, you, you mentioned uh, that the sanctions, that the sanctions have really worked. And I, but the point you know, that I was really trying to make with that is, is, is that the sanctions by themselves really, it's, it's more, you, you have to have countries willing to step in and enforce. And I don't think we really do need more sanctions. In fact, there's some pretty spiffy Poisson and logistic regression models that show that there's, there's statistically significant correlation between the advancement of North Korea's nuclear program and sanctions. So did sanctions kind of help propel the Nuclear pro did it give the nuclear program milestones to work against? Just don't know. But uh, but that'd be an excellent, excellent question. Thank, Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I, I like such a response well turn by turn, uh, so that we can invite the more more wise or I mean the more uh, uh, genius the uh, uh, views and ideas on this North Korean nuclear issues. Uh, I'd like to open this discussion to the floor. Okay, well, the young lady, the, uh, uh, the no. second line, would you first, the, uh, please introduce yourself uh, and the, uh, uh, please be specific in your question. Uh, uh, Hello, I'm Tara O oh of um, Stella at the ICAST and also at Pacific Org. Um, thank you very much uh, for the panel for your insightful comments. Um, I think when we think about whether North Korea will denuclearize or not, uh, or whether we can live with a nuclear North Korea, um, as was mentioned, um, I think we have to really think about what, why did North Korea, why did Kim Jong-un develop nuclear weapons in the first place? What threatens him? What threatens the regime? Um, and, you know, was it really, did North Korea really develop nuclear weapons because they're afraid of U.S. attack? Or is it something else? And, and I think to help answer that question, we have to look at the goal of the North Korean regime, which has been consistent for, since its existence. And that is to unify the Korean Peninsula under its rule, as mentioned by Dr. Song earlier. And if that's the case, well, what, what's, what are the threats to his rule? Um, that is the, exist, the very existence of South Korea that is free, uh, liberal democracy and market economy. Because he's afraid of his own people, despite all the fear and despite all the um, 
you know, propaganda, uh, he does fear that his people might want to choose freedom. Maybe, you know, they might want to choose uh, the freedom to go from one place to another without a, a permit. Uh, or to not get punished if they don't dust the pictures of Kim, Kim Il-sung and the Kim family. So, if that's the case, um, and so, so, you know, walking it back, if the existence of South Korea, not what South Korea does, but very existence of threat to North Korean regime, and therefore it wants to dominate it using nuclear weapons as a course of weapon, then what's the incentive for it to change? What's the incentive for it to give up its nuclear weapons? And if if there's a decision that we're going to live with a nuclear North Korea, then given its goal, um, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be, I don't think North Korea would be happy just getting paid off, you know, throughout the time. I think it'll do something more, and are we willing to live with that? So I was wondering if the panelists have comments on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Who is the next? Oh, please, the, uh, the, the with the glasses, the, uh, the yourself. No, no, the, the, uh, yourself. Please. Do introduce yourself first. Um, I, is it on? Yeah. Uh, oh, Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. Uh, so the panel has showed uh, a variety of, of views. And uh, my question is, uh, I've heard that there's a quite a division, a serious division, among the elites in South Korea on the issue of how to address the denuclearization. So I've heard some extraordinary statements made by certain members of the elite against President Moon, against his immediate associates, uh, declaring that they're uh, the leftovers of the 386th generation, that, that they really don't represent the South Korean position, that it's some kind of sellout. I mean, uh, I don't think I'm exaggerating and putting into those terms. So I would like to ask, perhaps I could direct it to a General uh, Song, and uh, if, if it's possible for the commentator, Dr. Lee, to, to, answer, uh, to address the question. Uh, to what extent is this serious uh, split and... Uh, of course, we're familiar with splits here in the U.S. at the moment, uh, going to affect uh, any kind of successful uh, resolution of uh, North Korean issue. Thank you. Thank you. The next one. Would you be uh, you know, with... Uh, I'm a Peter Humphrey. I'm an intelligence yeah, analyst. Ne next, well, next one, you, you, you need to prepare. Okay, go ahead. I'm an please. intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. I note that uh, as long as there are submarines, we cannot denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. So we should refer to this as terrestrial denuclearization. Secondarily, I note that uh, uranium mining continues apace. The thing that blows me away about all this is there seems to be no discussion of the fact that North Korea has six weapons of mass destruction. It has nuclear weapons. It has ballistic missiles. It has chemical weapons. It has biological weapons. It has swarms of drones that nobody talks about, and it has political prison camps that kill many hundreds of people every single month. So we're going to a place where we're going to remove one of the weapons, the one weapon that cannot be used at all because it assures absolute devastating blowback, and leave the other five weapons in place, including one that kills hundreds of people every single month. Does this make sense to anybody but me? Um, does anybody actually think that North Korea is going to allow IAEA or OPCW inspectors to run around the country uninhibited when half the nuclear infrastructure can be hidden in those same prison camps? Um, is there anything more evil than offering security guarantees to a mass murderer? Good, uh, thank you. And uh, Dr. Yugo, please. I wrote to uh, Hugo Kim, International Council of Korean Studies. Based on your discussions and presentations, I wrote two questions. Number one, if North Korean denuclearization is fake, by its intentional delay, how would the new sanction affect all power relations in the Korean Peninsula? Second question, uh, do you think anybody, do you think the impending West China trade conflict is related to the denuclearization of North Korea? 
if this is the case, how is the trade conflict related to China's military expansion in South China Sea? So maybe it's boundary, out of boundary of the discussion, but if you give uh, me good answers, I think you have good capacity of it. Thank you. Good point. Good point. Okay, next one. So, big, big, oh, please. The, uh, Thank you. I'm Bill Newcomb. I'm a fellow at C4ADS. I'd like to make a comment uh, or response by uh, the panel. Uh, I was struck by Dr. Lee's um, options. Uh, he raised the option of containment. Now, I think the U.S. is quite practicing containment. We've been doing containment for decades now. But I don't think containment is an option unless you look at uh, the issue in the narrowest sense. Because what we're talking about with uh, containment of a nuclear state is allowing North Korea to be recognized as such. If that's true, then you might as well say that the efforts of the Security Council, and particularly the Perm 5, uh, were quite impotent. That the autonomous efforts of the US and the EU were likely, were Similarly, ineffective. You should tear up the NPT because that's not going to be holding anyone else that's thinking about a nuclear breakout to account. And you might as well disband the IAEA because it's not money being well spent anymore. We're back to what the political scientists termed the nth country problem about uh, 30 years ago. And so I don't think allowing North Korea to set the standard and encourage other states to become <laughs> nuclear breakouts. And we can list them very quickly, right? I mean, is Japan going to feel secure with their nuclear North Korea? Is Taiwan going to feel secure? Is Iran going to be encouraged to restart its, its nuclear weapons program? Will Saudi Arabia respond by just sitting on its hands? And then in our own hemisphere, uh, it's very easy for a country like Brazil that had a program that it uh, stopped to resume one. So once that starts, uh, what's the end to it? Thank you. Good point. And, okay, you, you go first. Well, he was the, uh, the, uh, the action uh, level, the participant uh, for North Korean sanction from the financial side. It is a good question. All right, next uh, one. Yes, I'm Mike Billington. I'm with Executive Intelligence Review. Um, I think everyone knows that both uh, Moon Jae-in and President Trump presented the North with a uh, development program, the thumb drive that, that uh, Moon presented and the video that Trump presented. Uh, and in both cases, they're very much linked with this, uh, this new Silk Road process, which is really redefining the world uh, in a very significant way. Uh, in fact, Trump's video even had pictures of Chinese high-speed rail. And of course, China, Russia is also already discussing reopening uh, the railroads, the pipelines, Moon is talking to them. So I think uh, the question here is, we haven't discussed at all the potential for the collaboration between all of these countries in the new Silk Road as a basis for really establishing some trust that there's going to be ongoing development which would include trust in the North. Good point. We haven't discussed the, uh, this one in this session. Anyway, well, good question. All right. Good. Um, uh, now, the, uh, uh, we would like to uh, the, uh, discuss any anyone more? Okay. Please, the, you are you will be the last question here. <laughs> Major William Taylor from the uh, U.S. Air Force. A couple of questions. Uh, I think it's one, sir. I think you brought up, uh, you said it appears the sanctions brought North Korea to the table. Um, I wrote down here, but if they're invading them, what is KJU's play? You know, and this also goes into uh, a second question I have. So as the agreements are signed um, and deals are made, what, and the sanctions will likely be removed at some point in time, so what and in what time frame will North Korea do with the lifted sanctions? So sanctions are lifted, money's given back to them. They're already evading them. 
what and what time frame, not knowing their intent, do we think that North Korea is going to do with that money? Good point. Good point. All right. Uh, now we would like to listen to from the presenters first, and the, uh, with you too, if you have the uh, ideas, please respond to the questions. All right. Thank you for your wonderful questions. Ms. O, oh, yeah. um, uh, you asked what is the purpose uh, the North Korea created the uh, nuclear development program. Uh, the, the many uh, purpose, I think. Uh, uh, they always propaganda because of the threat of the United States. This is one of uh, uh, their purpose. And another one, under uh, unification under their regimes. Uh, this is uh, one of the biggest one. Uh, the other one, a survival. It's okay uh, uh, with the uh, WMD. They are negotiated. Okay, give me much money, and uh, what do you uh, uh, help for me? Now they are negotiated. That is one, and uh, this, uh, that is also economy ones. So uh, their purpose could be very complex one. This is my uh, 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 compound one, and uh, uh, this is my uh, uh, views. And uh, second, uh, how we can change it, uh, that one of, of you asked there. So uh, in the international politics, uh, we learned that one. Uh, to change the political system, uh, we need changing the leadership. So without changing the leadership, we cannot expect the political systems. Second question, Sloan, Mr. Sloan. Okay, uh, Korean, South Korean society divided into, uh, uh, in terms of uh, denuclearization, etc. Actually, we have to divide it. One group, left-leaning group, the other one, right-leaning groups. So, what is the difference? The right-winning uh, group uh, has the conception about the North Korea. North Korea is our same race, brothers, but till now our enemy. But the left-leaning groups, they are our same race, our brother, they are not our enemies. Uh, there is a big difference. Because of this difference, there are many kinds of different arguments. So, uh, to, uh, uh, to the WMD of North Korea, uh, the left-leaning groups, they argue that is not a threat of weapon uh, toward the South Korean people or something like that. So if you see in outside, uh, it is so difficult to understand why they divide it into like this one. Uh, so, and the uh, third question, uh, Uh, why uh, didn't you mention uh, the uh, chemistry weapon, biological weapon, etc.? So uh, we also very seriously uh, care about uh, total WMD. Uh, then we love so much the Bolton's idea: uh, nuclear weapon, chemical weapon biological weapon, all such kind of weapon, and including the specialist uh, relating to the uh, new, uh, WMD programs, all send to the Tennessee and uh, Oakley So we welcome to so much that one. That is, in a sense, a complete CVID. We are so concerned about all those kind of weapons. Question four, Victor Yu, you go. Uh, relating to the Chinese, uh, South China Sea threat and the North Korea denuclearization uh, issues. I think uh, the main issue uh, for the United States would be South China issue. Uh, uh, this remained one. Uh, before maybe uh, we are so busy, uh, United States have been so busy, to resolve the North Korea nuclear issue. Uh, this is my uh, viewpoint. And uh, uh, 
in terms of sanction uh, UN. Uh, Mike Beer, uh, the, our president of Moon, and uh, Trump's the viewpoint, which you know, predict the Trump's viewpoint. Uh, so in terms of diplomacy, in a sense, uh, we can understand. The, so after the Singapore summit meeting, even though the conservative group divided into two groups, here is the other groups. So, what is what is the purpose for the Soviet meeting? Is the normalization between United States and the North Korea over for the CBID? We divided into it. My viewpoint: everybody knows their, uh, the the primary one purpose for the Soviet meeting. Uh, they knew. Uh, CBID, but the uh, United States actual the purpose is not CBID, the normalization between United States and North Korea. This is my viewpoint. So if they created the normalization between both countries, CBID and uh, uh, military drill, and everything is the next uh, priorities. Uh, now. Uh, in terms of this viewpoint, I am trying to understand every uh, Trump's behavior. Uh, if we don't see uh, this viewpoint, we cannot understand uh, the everything uh, lately, uh, the, the uh, President Trump's behavior. Uh, this is my uh, viewpoint. And uh, President Moon Jae-in uh, always argued well, we should resolve peacefully uh, the North Korea issue. But uh, there is a uh, so different uh, uh, viewpoint uh, from me. Uh, if, uh, if it is uh, possible, it was possible, already uh, the North Korea's uh, nuclear issue had been resolved. Uh, so, uh, we should mobilize uh, all kinds of measures. Uh, this is my view. Okay, well, a wide uh, and interesting variety of questions. To Dr. O's question, why why did North Korea develop nuclear weapons? I, I excellent question. I mean, the program has been. I mean, they started, I think, with cooperative agreements with the Soviet Union back in the 1950s. So technically, the program has been around for a long time. I think from the start it was it's been a revisionist program. I don't know that the United States and the Rock Alliance was the initial target, but I think 1989 was a was a pretty dramatic year with communism collapsing around the world, dictators like Noriega being extracted and ex extradited. Uh, a lot of bad things happened that year, and I think a decision was probably made at that point that the program was targeting the Rock U.S. Alliance. So maybe not initially, but I think where we stand now, it's it's certainly. Uh, if, if you're from the revisionist IR school, then it's targeted against the alliance. The uh, question and, and the comments from Mr. Humphrey on uh, the submarines, that's, that's an excellent point. I mean, that's, that's certainly going to come up in, this, in uh, negotiations, I'm sure. The other weapons of mass destruction, absolutely. Um, where do they stand? I think nuclear has been chosen as the, uh, the topic du jour that's got to be solved first. I don't think the other issues are going to come in, unfortunately. You know, it's like a particularly human rights issue. It's not going to be on the table until the nuclear issues talked to first. And uh, the trade issues with China. Yeah, I do. Is for uh, Hugo Kim. I, I think the uh, it's all interconnected. You know, I, I'm sure that's being factored in, and uh, and it's part of the play with uh, with China. Um, and, and keep it. You know, there's so much going on right now. If if one were to really spread the table out and look. There's consolidation of U.S. forces on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, Camp Humphreys is, is absorbing the Army's footprint right now. There's uh, the ROC is looking at moving three strategic air bases, Taegu, Kwangju, Suwon air bases, could result result in the, a changing U.S. Air Force footprint. Congress is authorized to build to create a, a floor for U.S. troops in Korea, 22,000. Why 22,000? Don't know. But uh, so there's so much going on. There's rock U.S. negotiations going on with defense cost sharing, and it's all interrelated. I mean, all of this is out there, and it's probably all connected in some form or another. Um, the uh, the question, Bill Newcomb's point on uh, 
devaluing the NPT if, if North Korea is recognized as a nuclear state, I think is, a, is an excellent point. I mean, there's so much at stake by recognizing North Korea, it really unravels and uh, it kind of, it kind of the house of cards falls down on the entire UN effort. Um, Mr. Billings, the video it was interesting. Did everybody see that? It was pretty interesting. Um, no, I don't think the U.S. is going to be part of the Silk Road. I don't think China, Russia, or any of those countries in that region have any plans on inviting the U.S. Uh, in investment. Now, I could be wrong, but I don't think the U.S. is their first partner. And uh, I think that was it. Oh, there was one question about what would Kim Jong-un do if sanctions are lifted. Now, ostensibly, he's got the economic line that he's going to re revitalize now that he's got the nuclear program in check. Um, I don't know. And if it does, but uh, I probably nothing that we, we would want him to do. <laughs> so. Yeah. Is there any, any idea in your approach of the to you was a uh, question about the uh, U.S. China relations and the uh, relations? Well, U.S. China relations, yeah, I, I think I think everything that we're working, particularly in the trade space with China right now, I think is, is interrelated. Not maybe primarily connected with the nuclear issue, but it's certainly part. I mean, as far in terms of negotiating what we do. Okay. Okay. Well, the uh, will, will you be first off? No. Oh, back in the place. Oh. Uh, thank you for uh, asking the question to uh, a discussant. Uh, it was a pleasant surprise. Uh, two thoughts I had. Uh, first, uh, the question about division within the elites. Um, division is an understatement. There's a polarization um, between the rightists and the leftists. And they all uh, support extreme measures. You know, the rightists have to go for uh, you know, forceful measures, including covert cooperation and military uh, strikes. And on the other hand, uh, there are uh, leftists who actually uh, are willing to bet the ROK-US alliance and the US military pageants in hopes of um, reassuring North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons. These are extreme measures. And I call for uh, nuclear deterrence a third option. Um, because I think those extreme measures will be risky and um, has very slim chance of success. We thought about those options in the past and they actually tried those, some of those options, but it never worked. So uh, why don't we just pursue what has been working, which is a deterrence? That has been working since 1953. So why not just strengthen that option further? Um, the second comment on uh, containment and the NPP system. I like the NPP system. I admire the system. I think that the system has been very valuable for you know, making our world safer. Having said that, um, I don't think, you know, uh, containing North Korea would undermine the NPT system very much. Uh, here are some reasons for that. Um, first, you know, NPT system is an instrument. It's not the goal itself. Preserving it is not the goal itself. The goal is international security. Okay? But I think, you know, if we go for these extreme measures just in order to save the entity system, then we are putting, you know, the cart before the horse. Because, you know, that extreme measures can undermine our, jeopardize our, our security rather than improving it. Okay. That's my first point. And second point, I don't think the NPT system worked historically. Just because it's a very solid institution, I don't think so. 
I believe that the MPP system has worked because it was unanimously backed by the nuclear powers, the P5, because they share the common interest in stopping nuclear proliferation, which could undermine their power position and prestige. So even if North Korea you know, holds on to its nuclear weapons, and the United States, China, Russia, France, and uh, Britain were very, try very hard to stop those nuclear dominoes from falling. Fortunately, those candidate states you laid out, you know, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Saudi Arabia, and Brazil, you know, to some extent depend on the United States. So the United States has a leverage over those countries with which to restrain them from going nuclear, you know, even though the United, the, you know, Pyongyang gets to uh, have those nuclear weapons for years or decades. And finally, a related point. I don't, uh, you know, North Korea having a nuclear weapons for some time sets a bad precedent. But bad precedent does not necessarily uh, translate into undermining of the institutions. For example, the NPT was opened for signature in 1986, but it didn't have muff, muscle, or teeth. The NPT became effective after India you know, detonated its first nuclear device in 1947. A bad precedent that alerted the international community. Okay? And that was the pretest for uh, all those nuclear armed powers, P5, to get together and to stop, try to stop further nuclear development. So I think this bad North Korean precedent will actually have a chance to boost the MPT system rather than undermine it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Scott. That's all well. Okay. Uh, and you may have the, uh, something to say. To no, do we have any more questions? Any other questions out there that we're not going to ask? Any other questions? Yeah. There's one right over here. Uh, Edward Eagles, it seems to me that an assumption given here is that. Would you? Uh, uh, okay. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Edward Eagles, uh, it seems as if an operating assumption is that we should focus on the question of whether there is a change in policy on the part of Point Yang. That may be the right question. Is it also possible that what's really changed is now a convergence of North Korean and Chinese policy? And so that that's the new factor. If it is, it shouldn't there be a comment and thought about this. Hmm. Okay. Thank you, sir. And you, well, I, 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 I need your comment. <laughs> well, <laughs> if any. Any other questions before we go? No, you know, my, my, my Well, the, the limited time we have here, but well, in next session, when the, uh, he, uh, well, is the moderator, you have enough of time. Uh, Dr. Lee dong -san, what he said uh, was uh, really impressive. Uh, that's why I'm going to raise my some observation. Uh, he very academically and fairly raised some challenges was uh, presented by Dr. Song. Uh, my inkling is that he has some very negative uh, ideas about uh, what uh, Dr. Song said. I mean, the COVID overt operation against North Korea or something like that. But uh, I understand Dr. Song is simply introducing that idea uh, just to be prepared against the rainy days 
I don't think he really means we should do this or do that right now. So in that sense, I think we can understand uh, talking about that kind of extreme options can be a part of uh, deterrence. So we don't necessarily have a negative assessment on that idea. Uh, and also, uh, uh, Professor Lee talked about MPT. As a student of MPT, actually, I wrote my PhD dissertation on MPT. Uh, I spent really a lot of time uh, thinking about the future of MPT. Uh, I fully understand that Dr. Lee emphasized a little bit more of uh, patience and moderate approach toward North Korea, rather than taking very extreme options immediately. Uh, yes, basically he's right. But I want to say, uh, not too much patience, not too much time. Uh, this I want to say, because he also said, uh, in history, no nuclear weapon state, or no state protected by nuclear umbrella has been attacked by nuclear weapons. He emphasized like that. Yes, he's right. But we have to think about another effect of nuclear weapons. If North Korea has kept nuclear weapons for a prolonged time in situations like Korean Peninsula, we have a terrorism confronting systems, and we have been militarily confronting for decades. Just the keeping nuclear weapons in the hands of North Korea can affect us very, very negatively, psychologically. It can change our voting behavior of South Koreans. Kind of uh, defeatism can spread. Uh, probably what we see right now may be the beginning of that kind of uh, phenomenon. So uh, just by saying that no nuclear weapon state or no state under the nuclear umbrella has been attacked, uh, that cannot justify that we should show endless tolerance and patience toward North Korea. Thank you very much. George, if I can ask you to uh, address the first yes. question, that would be very, very helpful on the China and North Korea uh, strategic yes, uh, vision. Yes, certainly. And uh, so, Mr. Eagles, the, uh, the assumption that, or the question that there is there a convergence between North Korea and, and Chinese policy, I, I think I mean, there's been a convergence. There's, there's been uh, state, head, head at state level meetings, and I, I think that uh, I think I don't know if there's if they're converging or they're conspiring on a policy, but they're probably celebrating uh, some of the, the outcome of the Singapore summit. I, I mean, I think the, the President Trump inadvertently or purposely, I don't, it has kind of worked his way into the, the Chinese uh, North Korean policy space by the freeze for freeze canceling the combined Rock U.S. exercises. It, Trump, President Trump's kind of help facilitate a little bit of a confer convergence there. Uh, other than that, I think it's too early to tell. Dr. Lee, would you like to discuss any more on the MPT? Yeah. No? <laughs> okay. No, nothing. Okay, we, we have about uh, 10 minutes. I want to give everyone a chance to uh, do what they have to do for the next 10 minutes while we're waiting for the ambassador to come here. As soon as the ambassador comes, I ask you to move back in here, and uh, the ambassador will give us a presentation. We're very lucky that uh, he changed his schedule to be here today. He was going to be on travel. General Kyo, who's the defense out of Shane, used whatever straight on tactics he used to get him here. So he's going to be here today, give us a presentation, and after that, we'll break and, uh, and head, to, head to lunch. So just take a break now in place or use the restroom or whatever you have to do. And I thank the panel. Great panel, give them a round of applause. Thank you.